Okay, I think we'll get started. Thank you for waiting a minute. Well, I'd like to welcome you all here today. I'm Nick Bazulak. I'm the Director of Continuing Studies. And this is Siobhan Haggett, the Administrator Administrative Coordinator of Continuing Studies, and we thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be discussing Teaching in the Now, 15 Creative Tips for the Modern Art Educator with Lauren Anderson. This webinar um, will be recorded and we ask you to type your questions in the chat so we can relay them for, relay the questions for you. So, it is my honor to introduce Lauren Anderson. Lauren graduated Mecca with a BFA in ceramics and is currently an MAT teacher candidate. She entered the Masters of Arts in Teaching program during the pandemic at the beginning of August last year. And due to how schools had to adjust so quickly, Lauren and her cohort in the MAT program had to learn very quickly how to teach online in person and of course the very common hybrid model. So they had an amazing year this year. They've learned so much and Lauren has learned so many tips along the way. She thought she'd share some with you today. Thank you. And so now Lauren would you like to share some tips for us? Thank you. Yes thank you so much Nick. Well hello everybody. Thank you again for being here. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and begin with my 15 tips that I have um, acquired throughout this process. And trust me, I have way more than 15, but I had to bring it down to 15 to share with you all today. So my first tip, don't be afraid to fail. And I know that the word fail is pretty heavy. So I like to use the word fail as more of learning experience, but it's hard to say, don't be afraid to have learning experiences. Um, so always remember that teachers are always learning to always remember that in the classroom, hybrid models, any way that you're teaching, you're constantly learning as well. The, the learning process never stops there. So thinking about failures as learning experiences instead and embracing it instead of stressing them. So during, say you're doing um, a lesson in class and something doesn't seem to be going right, embrace that to your students. Don't try to hide that. Um, something isn't going right. Just really embrace that and let them know this is what happens in art. This is what happens in real life and really give a life lesson out of those failures. Um, and then trial and error in a virtual setting, something that I know my co cohort and I have experienced a ton of this year, um, but really being open to trial and error throughout um, anything that you're doing virtually, whether it's Zoom meetings, um, online lessons, demonstration videos, there's no stopping. So just continue on with any trial and error that you have. Um, and just don't be afraid if it doesn't work out. Just live on, continue on and learn from it every time. My next tip, enforce experimentation. So it's super important as a teacher to keep an open mind um, for your students to allow those discoveries to be made. Um, let ideas happen even when you already may know the outcome. So maybe a student might be trying something out and you know eh, that probably won't work. I say it's the best to give that student the opportunity to make that discovery on their own without telling them, hey, that's not going to work. Um, let them just learn that. And I think that that goes for teaching as well. It's hard. Um, when someone tells you that it's not going to work, it almost makes me want to want to try harder to make it work. Um, and I think that that's something that your students also can learn from you um, from those learning experiences. And also unfamiliar materials are to be explored all the time. So if you're giving students a brand new material, say something like clay, don't expect a finished product right away. Give the students a lump of clay and just have them start manipulating it. And that goes for any materials, whether textiles, drawing, um, clay, any materials. Give them to them and have a point of practice before expecting a final product. Um, that's one of the biggest things I know even I learned in undergrad was just taking on any materials possible. So share that with your students as well. And experimentation also, um, I know that it might be tough in some virtual settings to get materials out to students. So always just be open to um, any materials that they may have to use if they don't have exactly what um, you may need for that lesson. My third tip, 
create opportunities for your students to make choices. So whether you are a choice-based teacher, TAB, um, any type of teacher, I say it's so important to allow for choices. Student, jo student choice also means student voice. That's one of my favorite um, lines. I think that I read that in one of our readings this year. Student choice means student voice. So being able to give your students the opportunity to have their own voice and to share their own ideas and opinions there. Um, allowing for choice also teaches independence. Independence is something that's really important to um, allow your students to have in the art room because they'll take that on to other stages of their life and other classes that they may have. Um, so teaching independence there, um, an awesome way to do that is to have labeled materials around your classroom. I know with the pandemic, it might be tough with sharing materials, but wherever you can, um, have some labeled materials out neatly for your students to be able to go and grab whenever they might want to use something and experiment. And this will allow them to independently make those choices of materials that they want to be using for whatever it is they're making. And choice also allows for genuine creative, pro, create, sorry, creative responses. So rather than forcing a material or forcing a concept onto a student where they may um, get a little bit stuck, I think, um, allowing for that choice really allows for them to tap into their own creative process and have their own creative responses there. Um, and really just showing that every student works differently, every student has their own creative process. And that idea of choice really allows them to go into those endeavors on their own. Number four, allow your students to contribute to classroom norms. So for those of you, if you don't know, classroom norms are the expectations of the normal everyday classroom procedures. So what do you expect every time that your students come into the classroom? So allowing your students to contribute to these sets up a successful classroom environment and also allows um, individual accountability for both virtual and in-person. So on your first um, class, first lesson of the year, be, be really um, firm about these norms that you have, because these are norms that you want to set in stone and you don't want them to kind of be pushed under the rug. So allowing your students to contribute is important because they're making up these norms. The students themselves will be like, okay, we need to do this to make it a successful space. We need to do this to make it respectful, positive. Um, and like I said, individual accountability. If the student creates these norms themselves, they put that expectation on themselves. So it's really holding them accountable for their actions in the classroom. Well, and I yes. I just have a question. Like, could you give me an example, please, of like maybe a norm set by a student? Do you have yeah. That? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, in my past placement, actually, I established norms. Um, it was really tough for the students to sit in their seats because it was the end of the day. So one of the norms that we created were um, a student said, if, if I would like to get out of my seat, I would like to be able to raise my hand and say, I need a moment to get out of my seat. And we established that as a norm. So instead of getting out of their seat without being told that they could, we establish it as a norm that they have the right to raise their hand, ask for a moment for a little walk break, and then we gave that to them. So that was definitely one of the, the biggest ones and allowed the students to um, make their own choices. If they needed to get up, then they had that opportunity to. Um, another one I can think of uh, for virtual classes opposed to in-person is really honing in on the norms of muting and unmuting the microphones, especially for the littles. <laughs> Sometimes they forget to turn their microphones off. So establishing that as a norm um, right at the beginning is definitely one of the big ones. Um, and also one that I created with my fourth graders at my Pond Cove Elementary lessons was the muting and unmuting of the mics. We kind of established that as a norm there. All right, my fifth tip, always be prepared to make accommodations. So this goes for lessons, materials, amount of work. I um, mean, it's definitely different in in-person and virtual settings. So I'll start with in-person settings. I'm always being prepared to make accommodations um, especially in this time of the pandemic, in my last student teaching placement, the students were 
um, in school two days a week and out of school two days a week. So it was really challenging um, sometimes for the students to keep up with the work that they were getting done at home and also in school. So it was really important for e to make accommodations for each student. Um, for example, if they had missed a couple demonstration videos or missed a, a couple sketchbook assignments, I would talk to them and say, hey, look, let's only get one or two done and we'll take that from there. So really accommodating for any situation that your students may um, be in. And I'm gonna tap into a little bit later on discussing students as individuals as well. Um, and being able to quickly adapt in a virtual setting is so important. Um, a lot of times the students may not have the materials that you sent them, they may have lost them, um, they may just have never received them. So just being able to quickly adapt. Um, a quick example I can give is during one of my fourth grade lessons with Pond Cove Elementary, we were making textile collages. And one of my students was um, at somebody else's house for the day and didn't have their materials to use. So I quickly thought on the fly and I was like, why don't you go grab some magazines, some recycled newspapers, materials, and use those for your collage instead of those um, textile materials. So just being able to really work with whatever the students have. Um, and that student ended up making an awesome collage um, completely grasp the concept, even though it was different materials. So that was really good. Um, and always expect the unexpected. Never walk into the classroom and think that you know exactly what's gonna happen each day because you really don't. Um, and that's also just one of the most exciting parts about teaching is just not knowing what to expect. So, you know, there's, it could be a range of like, not so good unexpected things, but also you can turn them into to really awesome experiences and accommodations there. All right, number six, so focusing on each student as an individual. This also um, goes hand in hand with my accommodations slide because it's really important to think about each and every student as, as an individual, as their own being, rather than um, grouping your students as a whole. And I know, especially um, within this time of the pandemic, the students that have been um, you know, really adapting to online learning and in-person learning hybrid models. So really just making sure that you're viewing each student as an individual and focusing on their needs rather than thinking about the classroom and the class as a whole. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about equality versus equity. I found this great, um, I was actually doing a little bit of research looking for different definitions um, for these two words that I felt really, um, really related to this idea of students as an individual. And I found two great definitions from the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health online. Um, equality means individual, means each individual or group is given the same resources or opportunity. So that was equality. And then equity, equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates the exact resources needed to be reached for an equal outcome. So a quick example that I would like to give, I actually stumbled upon this example um, a little while ago on like Facebook or something, and it just really stuck out to me. Um, so a teacher, a teacher made an example of equality versus equity for their students. And they said, okay, I'm gonna give everybody a Band-Aid. So they all got into a line and they, the teacher asked the first student, okay, what do you need your Band-Aid for? And they said, I have a scratch on my hand. So that teacher gave that student a Band-Aid and they put it right on the scratch on their hand. So now every student who came up got a Band-Aid and got it put on their hand. Regardless of anything that was wrong with them, they could have had a bump on their head. Each student got a Band-Aid right on their hand where that first student did. And that was a really great example of equality, meaning that each student was given the same resources, the same Band-Aid onto their hand. So then the teacher decided to, um, to make it more about equity at this point. So everybody got into another line and this teacher asked each and every student, where do you need your Band-Aid? So the first student needed it on their hand. The next student needed it on their head. The next needed it on their back. So it was about recognizing that each person had a completely different circumstance in that moment. Um, and these band-aids, of course, they're theoretical band-aids, but these band-aids could take place of lessons. So thinking about, okay, maybe that one student needed to do only a few more examples. 
the next student, you can't assume that that student needs the same thing. So just really focusing on um, that idea of equity in the classroom. All right, number seven, add variety into your lessons. Make sure to include artists of all genders, races, and ethnicities. Um, this can be within your lessons and also as posters and different visuals around your art classroom, just really making sure that you tap into just everyone, everyone in this whole world. Um, and that really gives your students examples that they can relate to and also are intrigued by. So. Um, as you're planning stuff in your classroom and you're hanging up these visuals, it's very important to add that variety because you never know what student is gonna relate to what. So really having every option possible open for any student to make um, any sort of relation to is super important. Um, and I know a lot of times in certain, um, certain periods of art, it gets, like, uh, what am I trying to say here? So if you're focusing on a certain period of art, a lot of times um, people go to the same few artists. I'm thinking like Van Gogh, Picasso, you know, like artists that we've seen a lot of times. So I think it's so important to really dig and do your research. Like what female artists may have come out of that time period? What um, artists of color may have come out of that time period? And really digging deeper rather than just kind of focusing on artists that we kind of see everywhere and um, there's just so many artists out there, contemporary and historical. So really adding that variety in there. Um, and also including examples of various mediums. I think that this is one of the most important tips I can give is really focusing on all of the different art forms. So yes, there's, you know, the fine arts, there's painting, sculpture, textile, ceramics. So there's all those fine arts, but thinking about various mediums that kids might see every day, um, does fashion designer brands, comic books, movies, um, so many different mediums that students can relate to and they might not even realize that it's art. Um, and I think that's one of the, the biggest things is really focusing on any, even like car design, shoe design, that everything is art. So adding that variety into the lesson um, and really expanding their horizons of what art really is. Um, and then lastly, including examples, you know, will intrigue your students. So if you know that some of your students are really into comic books or really into certain brands, maybe focus on some of those, um, those small ideas within your lessons. And, you know, it might get your students engaged immediately just from those small examples and also shows that you really care and listen to your students as well. Number eight, don't be afraid to ask for help. As my amazing professor, Dr. Rachel Somerville, always says to us, you don't always need to reinvent the wheel. And I think that this is something so, so awesome, especially about the pandemic and having so many different online forums and websites. Don't be afraid to look at those. Don't be afraid to take from those, whether it's lesson plans, assessments, um, visuals. You don't always need to reinvent the wheel there. Of course, a lot of times you'll find yourself reinventing the ideas that you find, but you don't always need to reinvent those ideas. There's amazing resources online. Um, a lot of teachers now, because of hybrid and virtual learning, have made online blogs um, just with different lesson plans. And there's so many different instructional videos on YouTube. So really utilizing those. I mean, also never be afraid to reach out to fellow teachers. That's one of the biggest things I think we're all going to get from this cohort is having everybody that we we've met here as a resource. Um, you know, we're now friends, but we're also always going to be fellow educators and fellow classmates. So just always just always reach out. Don't be afraid. And even like online groups, um, I'm actually part of some of these really awesome groups on Facebook that are like are in middle school are in um, high school and you can join those groups and it's just a bunch of teachers giving out resources um, just in different ways and I know a lot of people use those platforms so look into any online resources you can find. Oops number nine always accept donations um, we've done a lot of different reading this past um, year in this cohort about accepting donations and recycled materials um, and just always accept donations. The biggest reason is that they may stop happening. 
if you begin to turn down some of these donations, next time they may be like, oh, well, they didn't need it that time, so we won't offer it this time. So just really make sure that you say yes, even if it's something that you redonate or re-recycle, um, just always say yes, always take anything you can get. And you also never know um, what opportunities can arise from those donations. So maybe they sat in the closet for a couple of years, but um, just thinking that there's always opportunities for those. And also there's just so much stuff in this world. So things that are donated is awesome. And on to saving recycled materials as well, which is goes sort of within that donation um, concept there. Also happy Earth Day, <laughs> thinking about recycled materials. Um, but trash isn't always meant for the garbage. So that's one thing um, being at Mecca especially, I think that I've definitely learned is that one person's trash is always somebody else's treasure. Um, big thank you to the free bin and the free table for that one. But never throw anything away, especially if you have artist friends, artist teachers, any teachers in general, they probably have something they could do with those recycled materials. Um, recycled materials are also a learning experience for your students. So enforcing a positive impact on the environment, enforcing um, not letting these materials get thrown in the trash, um, and just really letting your students learn how to recycle things. And we did some awesome researching recently about acrylic painting on different types of canvases. So like there was different guitars, different um, just found materials that students were using as canvases, which I thought was so awesome and also brings painting into a whole new life or whatever form of art that it is. So always save recycled materials, except you should know when to say these need to go. If you haven't used them in a really long time, maybe it's time to collect some more recycled materials. But I think that the more that you have, the better there. 11. Express to your students how happy you are that they're in class today. This is something that's super, super important. I think especially, I've been saying this a lot, I know, but especially with the pandemic that's been going on, it's been a struggle for students to get out of bed and get to class. And even if it's, um, even if it's online classes, we all kind of know how that, that feels to feel sluggish in the morning having to do things. So just always thank them for being there. And it doesn't have to be the exact statement, I'm happy you're here today, but thanking them for being there, um, just always letting your students know how positive that it is that they're in the classroom, how important that it is for them to be there and just really thanking them. You know, the classroom really can't happen without them. So it may be a short sentence to say, thank you for being here. I'm so happy you're in class today. Um, but it's definitely a really powerful sentence. And also focusing on building positive relationships. You know, you always want your students to know that you're happy that they're there. Number 12, focus on your own attitude and patience. So this is something that um, I definitely was challenging myself with during my last placement. I know that we probably all were in the cohort being so stressed out and having so much on our plates, but really making sure that you never express a negative mood towards your students. So even if you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, even if you're just not feeling 100% that day, sometimes it's about putting that smile on your face and just letting your students know, I'm here, I'm present, and I'm happy to be here. Even if maybe your brain is saying like, I'm not that happy. Like just really letting your students know that you're feeling confident, you're happy. Never let your, con your confidence down. Always have your confidence up. Um, and focusing on your own attitude allows for personal reflection. So really looking back at how did my attitude affect my students day? How did my attitude affect that situation that just happened? Um, and being able to really reflect on the positives and the negatives of the situation. I mean, thinking about patients in a virtual environment, <laughs> something that has been extremely, extremely crucial. It's always having patients in a virtual environment. There's always going to be those students who want to unmute their mic so they could like a little into the camera or something silly or just make noises, but just have patience. Um, I think the one thing you can really um, you can really have successes from is showing that you're patient. So rather than getting angry, rather than snapping, take a deep breath, think about what it is that you wanna say, 
and then let your student know what it is that you would like them to do. So always try to come from a place of patience instead of anger. 13, build in time for your students to be active. I know that uh, my group and I, we, I was in a group with two other members of my cohort at Wainfleet Elementary, and this was a really big one. Um, we were doing outdoor activities, so we were right near the playground. So it was kind of like the playground mocking them, like, please come and play on me. So it was really important that we built in times during our lessons for those students to be active. It definitely made them not as, um, it made them not as like drawn towards the towards the playground. It made them want to be more focused when we would give them some moments to stand up and walk around and a little bit of a mask break, um, any sort of breaks that you can give. Um, and you can um, implement these during your lessons, or you can just give breaks um, at the end or at the beginning, but just giving them any students some time to move. Um, we were with elementary, but this goes for any students. I mean, think of yourselves. You might be sitting there. I mean, I know I'm kicking my feet right now. So just always wanting to be active. I'm um, giving them that chance. And there's so many opportunities to allow your students to be active while they're still paying attention, which may be fidget toys, rocking seats, chair bands. Um, I know a couple members of my cohort have um, experimented with some of these tools and it's been very helpful. Um, so just giving them something to focus on that may even help them focus more on uh, what they're what you're teaching them and what's in front of them. Lauren, what's yes. a chair band? A chair band. So they're big, like, I don't know if you've ever seen like workout bands, but they're bands that go at the bottom of the chair and you can kind of flick it with your foot and like bounce your feet on them. Um, so they're bands that just kind of go around the chair and they're there for the students who want to kick and um, just something to keep their feet busy which I would actually probably benefit from. <laughs> I think we all would. All right, 14, keep demonstrations as short as possible. I learned this one the hard way, but that's how we have to learn things, right? So focusing on what is most important to show during your demonstration. Um, I noticed in my my placement at Punkov Elementary was completely virtual. So I was doing a lot of demonstration videos, a lot of instructional material. And I noticed, um, I could see the views that I get on YouTube. I noticed that the longer my video was, the less views that I had. And that was just a really interesting thing that I realized a bit later on. But I noticed that if my videos were longer than about six or seven minutes, I had significantly less views than I did for the shorter ones that may have been four or five minutes. And then that goes for in class as well, always trying to keep it to like five to seven minutes, especially for elementary and middle school. Um, high schoolers would probably do a little bit longer, um, but just trying to keep it to that five to 10 minute mark and really just making as much time as possible for work time. The students are gonna become incredibly disengaged if they're just watching you do something. So during a demonstration, you may want to give them a little something to do, um, have them either draw with you or take notes, pass out some sticky notes. Um, I found that helpful in my middle school placement was passing out some sticky notes while I went over my, um, my slideshow instructional material so they could jot notes down and um, make observations. And I found that I had more participation when I, when I gave that option. Um, so for demonstration videos, I recommend recording your videos entirely, um, cutting the sound, and then doing a complete voiceover. Um, I do this in iMovie. So I turn my, um, I take my files and I download them into my computer and then I drop them into iMovie. And from iMovie, you're able to save them as a file where you can download to YouTube and download to anywhere that you may wanna put them. So I recommend doing it this way with no sound and then doing a voiceover because this will save you a lot of, um, a lot of that length. A lot of that length you might wanna get rid of in your videos. I found that often when I was talking through my videos as I was working, I then couldn't cut out something that I was saying without cutting out a part of the movie. Um, so it became really challenging. So record those videos and then do a, a voiceover for those videos because you'll be able to cut down some of that instructional material and really hone in on what is the most important things I need in this five to seven minutes. Um, 
And with that, I use video editing tools um, to speed up my video content. I use time lapse and iMovie. So sometimes I'll be giving a demonstration and it might entail cutting 10 to 15 pieces of paper. So I'll show my students how to cut one or two of them and then I'll completely time lapse the rest of it. So two minutes, three minutes of cutting was turned into like 20 seconds. Um, and if anyone ever wants any advice about that, please let me know. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm definitely not a um, absolute wizard with iMovie, but I've learned a ton from my past few placements that I've had. All right, and then my 15th tip is keep in touch with your own creative practice. I know it's been something that's been really challenging for both myself and everyone in my cohort to keep in touch with that practice, but we did some awesome work during Summer Institute when we were teaching each other lessons and we had opportunities to make. I um, mean, I think that was one of the most eye-opening and fun times throughout this entire program so far was us all making together, learning together and, um, just doing experiments. So even if it's just small step or experiments, always keep in touch with your creative practice. It may be even 15 or 20 minutes doing a little bit of painting, a little bit of drawing, journaling at the end of the day. But even if it's only 10, 15 minutes, give yourself that little bit of time each day to just stay in touch with your practice and um, just really keeping in tune with what led you to be an art educator, what led you to be here. Um, and for me, that's my love for making, my love for art, my love for sharing my art with the world. So although it might be hard, don't pressure yourself in those situations. If ideas aren't coming, they're not coming, but try to take a step back and think about what else can I do? Um, something I really love to do that I still feel keeps me in touch with my creative practice is cooking. So sometimes after a long day, maybe I don't wanna work on a painting or work on crocheting or anything like that, but I'll always take that little bit of time out of my day to do something creative for myself, even if it's cooking a nice meal or um, doing some nice makeup. I love to do my nails too, some designs there. Just really focus on yourself and think, what do I need right now? Um, what, what can I do for my creative practice and how can I keep myself engaged and keep myself motivated to teach art. And I think that the making process is going to be a lot of um, reminding you of why you're doing this. So that was my 15 tips. I want to thank everybody so much for being here. Great. Thank you, Lauren. I do have some questions. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Um, so you talked about when you make your videos, you do them, your demos, demo videos, you do them um, without sound, and then you do a voiceover. Could you maybe speak to like how you like what do you use to record and how do you set up like generally how do things how do you place your camera or lighting things of that nature what have you found that works well yeah definitely thank you um so for my setup i have been experimenting with a couple of different cameras and different ways of recording um one thing to really think about is how am i going to get my videos from whatever device it is that you're using onto your computer. Um, so I recommend getting a webcam that's built in, well, not built in that you can attach with a USB to your computer so that the videos automatically save as a file onto your computer. Um, I was in a situation where I have a Samsung phone and a, a MacBook, so it was not corresponding to any videos that I was taking on my phone. So it was really important that I found a webcam, a, a good quality, um, nice webcam that you can plug into your computer and anything you record saves as a file. You won't have to get that file. That file will be there ready for you. <laughs> um, and I always recommend for recording, I really like to record at an aerial view. I think it's important that um, the students see how your hands are working, almost like a shadow. Like if they were, almost like they were standing above you watching what they're doing. I find that the aerial view um, is the best, making sure that the only thing in the camera is whatever it is you're working on, um, having a blank space, nothing with, nothing with anything busy going on. Um, and, just have also just having what you need like right next to you is also super important. It gets really tricky when you have to stop a video or um, have to go and grab something. So just really making sure that you're recording at an aerial view, 
gives really good direction for the students of what they should be doing with their hands and also having those materials and also teaching your students to be organized um, within those videos. So for example, some of mine, um, my lessons involved like cutting pieces of paper and cutting pieces of fabric. And I would always have my, um, my camera at an aerial view and I would like put things in neat little piles and I would remind them, make sure that you have your neat little pile over here, any scraps put in that pile. Um, so having that aerial view allowed them to see what I was working on and also like the surrounding little piles and materials that I had there organized. Great, that's fantastic. Um, I do have another question. How have you encouraged student collaboration through the pandemic with um, social distancing and remote learning? Like just with the challenges of social distancing and remote learning? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, my groups and I, we did Wayne Fleet Elementary as well as South Portland Parks and Recreation. And we really wanted to have a collaborative component there. Um, at each of the places that we went, we had to keep a six foot distance. Um, we also couldn't share materials. So it was really a, a game of us figuring out how can we make a collaboration and also keep with these guidelines. So something recommended, always have a bottle of hand sanitizer. We always had a bottle of hand sanitizer with us. Um, we tried to even have each teacher have one so that if there's anything that needs to be shared, whether it's tape, a marker, scissors, always having that hand sanitizer there and reminding them to use it. Um, we created this collaborative tree as well as a collaborative spider web. So we had the students make their own small piece of art and then cut it out. And we would have them stand in a line and we gave each student a piece of tape. And one by one, they went up and put their piece onto whether it was a tree or the spider web. Um, so just really making sure that we were keeping with those guidelines and not sharing materials, um, having them lined up a good distance from each other, and really making sure they only went up one by one to put their piece of art onto the collaborative component. That's great. That sounds like fun. I have a question, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, are there any aspects of teaching art virtually that you feel are stronger online than like they would be in person? Like what are the values of online teaching? That's such a good question. The first thing that I can think of is um, I found that some students were more willing to talk online in some of my lessons. They seemed more willing to um, to make themselves known that they were there or to want to answer questions. And I think it was this, I'm, I'm talking about elementary with this experience. I think a lot of it was about them wanting attention, which although it, it could become a negative thing, it was constant engagement and constant um, feedback and conversation um, from those students. I think another thing also is um, being able to produce demonstrations and produce demonstration videos kind of easier than um, in a regular classroom setting, I can recall different situations of like huddling around a table trying to watch a demonstration and I'm, I'm pretty short so I'd always be like trying to see. Um, and I think a big thing with online learning is that demonstration videos and um, just videos in general are very intriguing. And also I think a video can almost always get students attention. Um, they're just so used to watching videos and staring at the screen. Obviously, it's not the most positive thing in general, but when it comes to class time, the students are so familiar with technology, sometimes even more than the teachers, um, that a lot of times the students are like helping guide us through how to work Zoom, and um, they, they're just very intelligent as a whole, the students um, nowadays with technology. So um, I think it gives them an experience an experience to teach us sometimes. I have a question, Lauren. Um, so this is a really hard one and it's okay if you don't have an answer, but do you have any like tips for helping the students who are like really exhausted with the screens? You know, like I know a lot of students love it, but I think it's also like getting close to the end of the year. Like how do you keep them engaged when it's like they're tired of being online? So I haven't exactly got to experience that myself just yet. Um, I was student teaching entirely virtually like in the middle of the year. So it seemed like we had a good amount of engagement. 
But something that I'm thinking is um, as a teacher, just really building in those opportunities to like search and explore and to not be in front of the screen. So maybe class time is 45 minutes, giving the students five, 10 minutes of introduction and then sending them off on their own. And this might work a bit better for middle um, and high school, maybe not so much elementary, but really just giving them the instructions and then having them maybe pop back on at the end of class for that five minutes, but just not pressuring them to sit in front of the screen the whole time. So if it's something that they could be doing, um, and obviously this is a, a point of building trust as well, that they're doing what they need to do, um, but letting them pop off and do their work and not feel pressured to be on the screen and then just pop back on to conclude class. Um, like I said, I haven't actually been able to experience that, but if I were to give my students um, any sort of leeway in virtual learning if they're exhausted. I think it'd just be minimizing the screen time as much as possible. And even if it's them not being on screen for that 25 minutes of class, just as a teacher, hoping that the trust is there, that they're doing their work and they might be more likely to get the work done if they're feeling comfortable and not pressured to be on screen. That's great, thank you. Are there any other questions for you would like to ask Lauren at this point? Well, Lauren, thank you so much. I've enjoyed everything that I've learned today. And thank you for reflecting on your experiences and sharing your wisdom with everything that you've learned in the classroom. Um, I really appreciated it. And um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. I super appreciate it. Um, hope you learned something from it and also happy Earth Day. I know that it's a big day for everyone to be here. So thank, thank you. you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Good night. <laughs>